Is it true that stocks are only gonna go up? That's what it kind of feels like. Well, at the least, they don't seem to be staying down. Worst case, sideways, maybe? Well, we're gonna do our market review and go over the data in this video. But before we do, you know, regardless of which way the market is going up, down, sideways, any which way, we're always controlling our risk and we're making decent profits. With this strategy that I teach in this free training, there's a link in this video and down below in the description and comments. Same strategy I use and that a ton of our fallible members use too. Check it out, because it's a free training. Now let's look at some data. So UBS's US Composite Positioning Indicator, which measures the active manager positioning using a proprietary database of over 930 mutual funds with AUM of 5.5 trillion across US equity mutual funds and allocation funds. That was a lot. I don't know why I read all that because the moral of the story is that these are the big players. And you can see their positioning right here with this blue line. See how it's really low compared to where it was? Well, that basically means all the big boys are under positioned risk. And in this case, when we're talking about risk, we're referring to equities, so stocks. And you can see the way this blue line is shooting up they've been aggressively trying to correct that so buy more and more and more they're trying to get on the trend of stocks only going up which may be part of the reason why we haven't broken this support level right here and remember i was talking about this level right here where the 200 day and the 50 day moving average on the s p are coinciding so it should be a pretty strong support and so far so good now if we broke this level to the downside then it's kind of like look out below we might face a pretty good correction but as i said so far so good now that under positioning of all these fund managers is kind of balanced out by how much speculation is going on in the options market. So the put call ratios, the moving average of those ratios, and this is inverted right here, you can see they're hitting high levels, meaning there's a lot more people buying calls than puts, meaning tons of bullish people. So now they're hitting levels that usually create fragility in the market. And when they hit these levels, we usually see decent sized corrections. Another interesting data point is that the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index, you know, the popular ETF, VTI, it's our its largest five day outflow in over a decade last week. Tons of people piling out. Now, is that necessarily bearish? I don't know, because retail has been getting super active in the market, so maybe they're just selling their ETFs to, you know, speculate on their own. Why buy VTI when you could buy Tesla? So that might not be a bearish sign. One market you could always look at if you're trying to look at global growth is copper. So when there's more copper being used, that's a signal that, like, things are getting back on track with the economy, because copper is a very important material, you know, for all our stuff that we want to build. So a promising sign on that front is that the cash market to three-month copper curve is close to flipping into backwardation. And all that means is a tightening market and likely higher copper prices ahead. And higher copper prices means people are buying more copper, right? Which means people are building more, which means the economy is getting back on track. Another interesting chart is that 42% of companies in the Russell 2000 have negative earnings now. It's the highest it's ever been. It's just nuts. You see this chart is making a high. And actually, I don't know why I said 42. It's not 42. It's around like 33, according to this chart. Regardless, it's the highest ever. So you can look at this two ways. In one way, you know, you could say it's horrible, or the other way is that you could say this is as bad as it's gonna get and things are gonna turn around. So it could be bearish, could be bullish, depending on how you look at it. Here's a chart that shows the difference in CCPV cases between states that opened earlier than other states that remain closed. You can see the ones that opened, the cases just spiked obviously, right? The ones that stay closed continue to drop lower. So this is another risk that we got to look out for in the market in case lockdowns become a thing again. For some reason, I doubt they will, but something to keep an eye on because of how that could affect the market. Another interesting thing to look at is oil production for everyone investing in oil stocks. You can see that weekly production rate in the US has just fallen off. They've given up two full years of gains at this point, which is very significant. And it does mean something for the oil price, because what do we know? Less supply than even with the same demand, you could see prices going higher. Some bullish news is that more US companies have been offering a brighter financial outlook than a gloomy one. And it's nice because we could pull up all this aggregated data in our Bloomberg terminal, but that's once again another signal that things might be turning around. Here's another interesting one, the Conference Board's Leading Indicator Economic Index. So the year-over-year -year percentage recently turned up from its lows. And you can see that right here, this red, see it's turning. Now it's too early to say whether it's a trend change or just like a blip, you know, and a further trend downwards. But if it is is a trend change, it would be very good for the market. Because when that year over year indicator is below zero and rising, the equity market tends to have its best average annualized equity returns. So they average 29.5%, which is pretty great. So if this thing is recovering historically, according to the statistics, we should have a good year in the stock market. Now, another interesting thing to look at is the popular narrative talking about how the market is completely disconnected from the economy. You can see all these headlines, they all say the same thing. So in some ways that's correct because they're clearly 
really is a disconnect, especially currently because historically speaking, this market doesn't make any sense. It's not following any of the typical bear market or recessionary playbooks. But is this really the correct way to look at things? Because maybe what the stock market is doing makes complete sense. So one quote to remember is Adam Robinson's about the no sense algorithm. And this is the guy who started Princeton Review. He's like a nationally ranked chess player, just genius. And now he consults for hedge funds. So what he said is that when someone says it makes no sense that really what they're saying is this. I have a dozen logical reasons why gold should be going higher, but it keeps going lower. Therefore, that makes no sense. But really what makes no sense is their model of the world. And he's just using the example of gold here, but think about stocks in the same way. So I know when that happens, there's some other very powerful reason why gold keeps going lower that trumps all other logical reasons. Things that don't make sense are an algorithm for finding opportunities. Where do we find good ideas? Look where no one looks. When things don't make sense, get into the trade. So that's what we're trying to do here. Like what's that very powerful reason that stocks keep going up? So the first thing is that we all know the market isn't the economy, right? That's true over the short term at least, but longer term, yes, the market is the economy because we need economic growth to drive earnings growth and credit growth. They're all connected. Now what Deutsche Bank has shown with a simple linear regression is that current US equity prices are consistent with US GDP growth. And that growth was 0.7% year over year in Q3. So they're keeping in line with a short lived shallow recession and a quick shape recovery. So from that perspective, yeah, the stock prices make sense. So what's difficult for people when it comes to the stock market is understanding that it's a forward looking machine. So it discounts things in the future. So markets only price in the current economic environment in the way that it will drive the future. So it's not based off what's happening now, but what's going to happen in the future. And it's difficult to think like this because, you know, all the financial media and everything, they wait for something to happen in the stock market and then they put a narrative behind it. So stock market goes down. Oh, it must be because CCPV cases are going up. It's just very reactionary and oftentimes wrong. And then they fit a narrative of what's going on now and extrapolate it into the future. But what they're failing to see is that everyone else is also reacting to the same narrative, including policymakers. So not only is what's happening now obvious and already priced in by investors, but the secondary and tertiary impacts, which include the actions of, you know, central banks and our government, they go without thought. But that's the important thing to look at and how it affects the future. So back in March, we were at the height of the panic, right? We were facing an unprecedented global economic recession. And even 14, 15 weeks in, we're still seeing initial jobless claims running at two and a half times the peak rate that was hit during the depths of the Great Recession. So it's a severe, severe crisis, but the government and the central banks reacted in kind, meaning they had a severe reaction. So their combination of fiscal transfers, which is giving money to everyone, and direct credit market backstops, which was buying all that corporate debt to prevent any fallen angels, it's been super effective. So research from Credit Suisse writes that consumer wallets are bursting at the seams, the result of massive government transfer payments, while earnings and other income have fallen by 3 9,000 per person, transfer payments have risen by 9.3,000 on an annual basis. And the result is an increase in personal savings from 4.2,000 to 18.6,000. While some portion of that is going to be banked, previously quarantined consumers appear ready to reopen their wallets. So this is just showing how effective those transfers were. People got a bunch of money and they're ready to spend it. And just as important, or even more so important to markets, the Fed expanded what they were doing in that secondary corporate bond market. So they're really providing a lot of support which is super positive for credit spreads and liquidity. And we know how important liquidity is for markets, right? If there's a lot of money sloshing around, that means stocks are just going to continue to go higher. If there's no money and liquidity is tight, that's when you got to worry about stocks dropping. So in that sense, the central bank did a really great job. So all our policy responses have been fantastic, but the market price is in the future, right? And judging from the price action over the last three months, it's pricing in a continuation and expansion of these policies. So Goldman Sachs wrote that Congress is most likely going to enact another 1.5 trillion in fiscal measures, most likely in late July or early August. So Congress's initial policy response to the CCPB was swift and powerful, but it now faces a number of fiscal deadlines, including the exhaustion of some businesses funds secured through the Paycheck Protection Program by late June. So while Congress's initial policy response to the CCPB was swift and powerful, it now faces a number of fiscal deadlines, including the exhaustion of some businesses funds secured through that Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP. So that was happening 
adjusting by late June. And then the start of the new fiscal year for all states is July 1st. And many states are facing significant revenue shortfalls and the expiration of the extra $600 a week in jobless benefits at the end of July. So to address all these fiscal cliffs, like all these things running out, we expect Congress will provide more targeted support to the hardest hit businesses, partially extend the extra jobless benefits at a lower rate of $300 a week through the end of the year and approve at least $200 billion in additional fiscal relief for states. So they got to plug up every hole. Anyone who's complaining, they got to give them money. Not saying they're complaining for no reason, but you know, this is how they backstop and provide liquidity. We also expect Congress to provide another round of stimulus payments to households similar in magnitude to the prior round. Taken together, we now think that roughly $800 billion of additional fiscal support will be enacted this calendar year, bringing the total discretionary spending in 2020 to around $3.4 trillion. We think the stimulus will more than offset the decline in disposable income, resulting from increased job losses. And full-year disposable income should grow around 4% in 2020. So they are doing so much that people's incomes are still growing even without jobs. That's how effective they are being and how much money they're throwing at this. So I always see these comments in our video that, hey, these these guys can't print forever you know this is just a fake market and it's true you can't do this forever because you're gonna destroy the dollar but that's more long term in the short term if you're printing and the stock market is going up you got to play what's happening right doesn't matter if it's a fake trend because as we're explaining here I mean what is a fake trend really if the market is pricing in what these guys are willing to do in the future then yeah stocks are gonna continue to go up so that's really where the market is today there are two gigantic opposing macro forces at work we got the huge liquidity shock caused by CCPV shutdowns, and then also the super impressive policy response from the government and the central banks. So where the market goes from here is gonna be determined by these two factors. So will the virus cause another round of shutdowns? And then will policymakers be able to stay on top of all of this to keep us afloat until we get a handle on this virus? So there's a lot of big ifs here, right? A lot of unknowns. It's important to remember that not even the market knows exactly how the future is gonna play out. It's just making its best bet based off all the people investing. So because there are so many very variables and unknowns in this equation, we should expect a lot of back and forth in stock prices. That's why we think there should be an extended range of sideways chop in US markets. So you can see some of the chop in the short term already happening, but you can also look at it as a range, like the stock market could keep going up and down from this high to this low over and over again. But at least that gives us trends to play, which is exactly what we do in this strategy I was talking about. You wanna be able to ride these trends higher and then have the right risk control in place in case this type of thing happens again this big drop and on this trend higher up here we've been taking profits moving up our stops really preparing for whichever way this market goes and that's kind of what you need in a strategy so if you want to use the strategy we're using or improve your own strategy definitely take this training like i said there's a link in this video and down below in the description and comments it's free check it out it could only help and if you like this video make sure you subscribe so you can see our future videos do that and i'll see you in the next one stay foul out there bye